right, let's all stand. Turn to page 346. Page 346, there is a way. There is a way for sin to be forgiven. There is a way prepared for you and me. There is a way that leads a soul to heaven. That way is Christ, the sinner's perfect plea. Look unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole. Then you will know the love of Calvary. There is a love that passes human measure. There is a love that's brighter than the day. There is a love that's richer than all treasure. The love of Christ excels in every way. Look unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole. Then you will know the love of Calvary. There is a place that Jesus is preparing. There is a place where sin will be no more. There is a place a promise will be sharing. That place is heaven, eternity's fair shore. Look unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole. Then you will know the love of Calvary. Amen. Andrew, would you pray, please? Amen. All right, turn to page 350. Page 350, are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's sight? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. You can be seated. James, I hadn't seen him. <clears throat> All right. Make some quick announcements. Okay. And you know what? I can take my sweet time today because this is part two of my sliced off loaf of bread. You know what I'm saying? And... Um, but I want to just give you some quick announcements, okay? And actually, if you'll look inside of your bulletin, now what do we got here? Okay, this one isn't mine, because I'll put some extra notes in mine. Is this one yours? I left it there for you. I got you. He's confusing me. He's confusing me. Um, tonight, I wanted to go ahead and make known to you. So, so tonight, I'm going to have a toad out. If you, when you walk to the left, you'll see these double doors that open up. I'm going to have a toad inside of there. We all know what a toad is, right? Nobody knows what a toad is. <laughs> Y'all are messing with me, aren't you? T-O-T-E, -T -T tote. Tote. You know, a bin. Do we know what a bin is? What? That's it. A tote. I taught you a new word, okay? I'm going to have a tote, a.k.a. a Ben, okay? Not, not, not Benjamin. Where's Benjamin at? He's somewhere. But a tote back there, okay, a Ben. I, I just it don't even sound right when I say a Ben. But, but I'm going to have it back there. And uh, what I want to ask you, if you can't, don't feel obligated, okay? If you want to get involved and help, that's fine. Uh, we're going to have a list of supplies that we're going to try and supply for the kids, like paper, pencil, sharpener, stuff like that for our school drive, our back-to-school uh, backpack drive that we're going to be doing in August. So we're trying to stockpile supplies. You say, I don't feel like shopping, okay? I'll give you an alternative. If you want to put some money in the change next week, because we're going to have an offering for that, ones, we take 50s, 100s, we'll probably take a credit card. I'm only kidding you. It's just a way that we can try and make a difference to supply some, you know, school supplies and some help in that area. And so Lord willing, next Sunday morning, remember I told you once a month I'm going to let the kids take up the offering, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, Nathaniel and Ella Anderson and Maria will be going um, down to Florida, so praying for them. And Corbin, we're not, we're, you're not leaving Corbin, are you? No. <laughs> yes. And so, um, yeah, I ain't watching Bailey. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so just remember the offering will be next week. Like I said, it, it's just change in ones. If you want to put anything bigger, I'm not going to stop you. I don't even think Doug would stop you. Would you stop anybody if they put anything bigger than a one? $1 there you go. <laughs> hot off the press. Printed hot off the press. $1,000 bill. About as fake as they get. But uh, but we're going to, like I said, take that up. That will be next Sunday. Now listen, next Sunday we only have Sunday school and Sunday morning, okay? No Sunday evening because we're going to have a cookout, a bouncy house for the kids, hot dogs, hamburgers. I even told some people, okay, it's not just for one, but I told some people I would have maybe some, some turkey hot dogs or veggie burgers or something like that to accommodate all people, okay? And uh, there was more than one person that asked me that, so I said, we'll get us some. You know what? I can eat anything. Don't bother me one bit. Now, do I prefer a pork hot dog? Absolutely. And, uh, but I'll eat any of it. So we're going to get that, have some other things. If you want to bring, listen to me, if you want to bring chips or a side of some sort or dessert, one of those three, 
Um, really, since it's a cookout, I'm not stressing it because I'll be fine and we'll have chips, hamburgers, and hot dogs. And if it's a cookout, it's easier. It's just easier to eat chips and that instead of everything. And you can eat it with your hand. You don't have to sit down. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and I can eat everything with just my, my, my utensils right here. You know what I'm saying? So it just makes it easier that way. But if you want to bring anything extra, you have to. I'm not pressuring it because, like I said, that's the main thing that we're going to eat. And um, I want to ask you to have a special, we're going to have a special time of prayer here in a moment for Joe Little. Uh, Vera reached out to me, and I was in touch with uh, Pat, Joe's wife, last night. He, he's had a cluster of uh, kidney stones, and so they were supposed to do a procedure today to blast the stones, and his kidneys are uh, uh, failing. They're shutting down, I think. And uh, it's just, it's pretty severe. So we're going to have a special time of prayer for Joe Little. And, uh, and obviously keep praying for the other people. I think about Miss Nancy's got an appointment coming up uh, it's in June. What, what, what day is that again, Miss Nancy? Thursday. Yeah. They're... So we'll, we'll, we'll continue still praying. She had a doctor's appointment for that. Uh, remember to pray for Donna. She's had surgery on both of her eyes, and so she's still recovering. And then uh, for Doug and Sue's neighbor, he's only in his 30s, and he had some kind of complication. And the, huh? And his Jonathan. Jonathan. So remember that. And um, like I said, uh, let's remember these people. Um, does anybody else have anything? While we're praying, it ain't going to hurt. Like I said, I'm going to take my, my sweet, happy time. Yes, ma'am. Who's that? Chris Baker. He's a pastor. He's having open heart surgery tomorrow. We'll pray for him. Yes, ma'am. And um, got to do that right there. Does anybody else have anything? Also, want to remind you, okay? When you walk out these doors. Look to your right. If you have any prayer requests, I promise you, you can fill out a prayer slip in the seat back in front of you and drop it in that prayer box, and we will pray for you over it, okay? And then also, if you look to the right of the prayer box, now Stan did a beautiful job putting us a uh, track rack up and grab all the tracks you want. You say, I only see a few there. we got 2500 so you, you help yourself. We do charge $5 a track. <laughs> okay? The more, the merrier. And then also, if you would like a CD for your car, your house, or anything, this is a missionary family of uh, friends of mine, and they provided us some music, and I wanted, to be a I wanted it to be a blessing to the church family or anybody that may want some good music. These are good families. Uh, this is a good family. They're friends of mine, and uh, I believe it was a help to them, us getting this music, but I believe it'll be a help to us, and this is some good music. Like I said, and you can have it. Uh, in the back, Doug will help you hand it to you. And let's say we run out of this. We've got some more coming from a different family, and uh, so you can have some. But my mindset behind it is we want it to be a blessing and provide some music for you, okay? And then Heather's got her ladies' meeting Tuesday at 6.30. You come and be a part of that. And then I also want to give you a couple other quick announcements. June the 11th, okay, is Hot Diggity Dog Day. Now you say, what is that? Okay. How many people like how that just rolls? Hot diggity dog. Say it just like that. Hot diggity dog. And uh, you say, what is that? June the 11th, we're going to set up some tables. I keep wanting to point this way. Right here. We're going to have our grill out, have some tables set up with some uh, drinks, chips, hot dogs. And when the cars pass, we're going to have signs set up. People can stop, pick a hot dog up, have a track inside, invite them to church, and then they send are sent on their way, because this has a lot of traffic. So we do need some help, and uh, we'll have people cooking, we'll have people uh, packing, we'll have people greeting, we'll have people holding signs. I mean, it'll be a church-wide way of trying to be a blessing, and uh, I hope you come and be a part of that. It'll be fun. It'll probably be hot, but uh, it'll make you appreciate the AC. You know what I'm saying? So put that down. And then Father's Day, June 19th, even if you're not a father... I'm going to deal with the men. We're going to, I'm going to skin you alive, okay? 
And sorry, Nathan, uh, Nathaniel, you, uh, we're all going to get it. All of us. Every last one of us. From the oldest to the youngest. Ain't that right, Hudson? We can't, can't discriminate. We're going to get everybody. And uh, I'm only kidding you. But I do have an interesting thought on my heart and my mind for that day. So you just remember that. Wives, bring your husbands. And I promise you, when he leaves here, he'll be saying, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and, uh, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer. But just before we do, I'm going to call our men up to take our morning uh, tithe and offering. And uh, how many people can just by an uplift of hand say it's good to be in church this morning? A few of us, okay, ish, ish, so-so. And um, it is good to be in church. How many people could say they could praise the Lord this morning? All right. Clint, would you mind asking God's blessing over our offering if you don't mind, sir? Let's all stand one more time and turn to page 352. Page 352. Look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I give. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, or will you live? Look to Jesus now and live. Things recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I have a message full of love, hallelujah. A message from the Lord for you. Tis a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said it and I know it's true. Look and live or will you live? Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Life is offered unto you, hallelujah, eternal life your soul shall have. If you'll only look to him, hallelujah, look to Jesus who alone can save. Look and live, or will you live? Look to Jesus now and live. In his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Amen. You be seated. Quick announcement. Uh, after the service, there's going to be a special practice for music, and then we're going to have choir practice.
Amen. All right. Jane, I'm, I'm cutting this on. I didn't say anything quite yet. <clears throat> I'm going to dismiss the kids, too. I don't know why I do that. I forget it every week, just about. Not quite. Dismiss the kids. All right. James chapter number two. All right. My mic's on too, right? Uh, Jacob, we're good? Okay. All right. James chapter number two. We're going to finish up James two, this section. And I will tell you, okay, when I do the second part of this chapter, it, it, it might be a little different. We're just probably going to walk right through it because it, it, it is a little bit, that's a hard section, I'm telling you. And I believe it's one of the most misrepresented and abused sections, okay? But it's a beautiful section, and uh, that deals with uh, faith without works is dead. Now, before you jump to a conclusion, um, let me share with it, not tonight, not today, but another day. Okay, And not next week either because we got Memorial Day. So I'm going to do a little bit of a different message. But James chapter 2, we're going to pick up where we left off. And real quickly, as we're turning there, I want to just remind you that remember James is a book that's designed to help us grow. It's, it's designed to help us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and you know what's interesting about the book of James? James is a very practical book. It's a book of wisdom. It's a book designed to give us practical truths. Now, if I ask you this question, how many of you like it when you feel like as you're listening to preaching or teaching, it walks all over you? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? It, it, I mean, it, it rubs you raw, so to speak. You, your fur likes to go one way, and it rubs against the fur, against the grain. You know, one preacher said, if you don't like the way it rubs against you, just turn the other way. And... Uh, <laughs> And the idea behind it, James is a very practical book. He didn't make no bones about it. He pulled out his spiritual shotgun and he's, he's spraying and praying everything. You know what I mean? I mean, he's dealing with uh, temptation. He deals with trials. He deals with anger. He deals with the tongue. He deals with spirituality or religious behavior. He deals with, as we're here, impartiality. And by the way, that's only the first part, not even of the book. We didn't even hit the halfway point. And uh, how many of you can say it touched something where you're at, okay? It did me, every single section. <laughs> and it helps me. But you know something, as I said, it's designed to help us where we're at, to, to get us right, to grow us, to mature us, and, and to move us where God wants us to be. And so, as we're going to look at uh, James chapter number 2, I'm, I cannot talk and flip the Bible. I don't know why I can't do that. But James chapter 2, verse number 1, he's going to deal with this subject of favoritism or partiality. And let me say this. As I'm dealing with this subject, it's not a matter of favoring people as God does, or as we think. It's not God favoring people or excusing sin. God does not excuse sin. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God does not like sin. God does not wink at sin. God does not condone sin. God detests sin. If you don't think so, the Lord Jesus died for what? Our sin. And so it's not a matter of a sin. It's not anything with sin. It deals with people and who they are. And it deals with the fact that mankind is more than their substance. We agree to that, right? Mankind is more than the color of a person's skin, the education they may have, the intellect that they may have, have obtained through life. It, 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 and people want to respect people based on that. Well, God doesn't do that. And He deals with it in the area of James, and He helps him to understand the flaw, as I called it, of favoritism, okay? The flaw of favoritism. And uh, you know one thing I love about people? I mean, it's like ice cream. you got all kinds of different ice cream. And I like it all. I, you know, I like all kinds of people. you got to have some that may not be uh, quite playing with a full deck of cards, and you may have some that may have more cards than you. You know what I'm saying? That's okay. We make the world go round, amen? <laughs> and uh, by the way, I'm probably one of them that don't have a full deck of cards. <laughs> but James chapter number 2, you got to laugh every now and then. All right, James 2 verse number 1. My brethren, again, this is a word that's used many times in the book of James. It's an idea 
that he's stressing to them the family of God. He's dealing with believers. He ain't dealing with the Jewish brethren. He's dealing with the believers in Christ. His brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact, the family of God have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. He says that, that, that don't be a person that respects people based on anything. It, don't be a respecter of persons, he says. Again, as I said, it's not a matter of excusing sin, whether it be through a lifestyle, whether it be through uh, uh, anything, any kind of sin. It's not a matter of that. Sin is sin. God detests sin. But the fact is, you should love people and accept people and realize that, you know what, they may not be wealthy, they may not be, or they may be poor, they may not have the nicest clothing. That's what it is, okay? And uh, by the way, I choose to separate away from some people because of lifestyles, because of sin, because of things that I don't want in, around me. And it uh, doesn't mean that I don't respect them. I choose to separate from them. Amen? We're in agreement. Verse 2. For if there come unto you, under your assembly a man with a gold ring and a goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him and that weareth the gay clothing or the happy clothing, the colorful clothing, and say to him, Sit thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Verse number 4, Are ye not, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and ye you become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment cease. Do not, do not they blaspheme uh, that worthy name by the which ye are called. If ye fulfill, this is where we left off, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law. As transgressors, for whosoever shall keep the law, the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, "Do not commit adultery," said also, "Do not kill." Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, <laughs> as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. You know, it's interesting, just on a quick side note, the Bible's not called the law of being shackled. It's the law of liberty. The law that liberates, sets free. The Word of God brings freedom and liberation. And that's what he deals with. He says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, and that showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Okay? And as I said, we're dealing with the flaw or the, faith, the, the, the fatal attitude of favoritism. And the fallacy of favoritism, the, the, the error of partiality, okay? The error of learning that, that when I'm partial, it's wrong. It's fatally wrong. It's an error. It's against God. And it should not be named among God's people. It should not be named in His churches. It should not be a part of a Christian's life, okay? As I said, it's not a matter of standing against sin. I'll tell you right now, I'll stand against some sins that I have nothing or I have no pleasure in. I don't want my family around. I don't want anything of that nature around my family. I just don't. There are certain drugs and things and, and perversion in this world. But I want to tell you something. As I look at people, I've got to see people for what they are. That they are something in the eyes of God. Amen? And he deals with this idea of a respecter of persons. As I said, partiality or partial means to divide. It means to make a distinction. It means to prefer or discriminate, okay, based on the externals, all right? And, uh, and if we're not careful, it can be a part of all of our lives. And uh, before you say no, okay, how many of you have ever been partial? I'm going to raise my hand. It's not a matter of discrimination. Like I said, I'll deal with that. But let me say it this way. Every person here, I guarantee you, has had some partiality towards somebody else. And Because uh, many times we think partiality is the idea of showing just favoritism to Anderson. Anderson's the friend that I'm going to be partial to. Sorry, Warren. 
But you know what? We think partiality is the idea of being partial, favoring. I'm partial to Him. I give Him attention. But let me tell you what partiality encompasses more than that. See, when I'm partial, this is what it is. I show favoritism to Him. But what about the other people? I may not be favoring them. I may not disdain them. I may not detest them. But you know what favoritism does? It neglects other people. And you know what I am when I neglect people? When I just walk in church and I bypass him, bypass, I just bypass everybody, boom, Benjamin. And I give Benjamin the, the time of day. All right, they probably thought I walked off camera and I took off. <laughs> but you know what? Partiality encompasses, as I said, it's more than just giving attention to one person. It's realizing that you know what? When I neglect people, not, not willingly taking conscious thought of it, but when I just simply neglect people, I'm being partial. It's learning to put others before yourself. It's realizing that people are people of needs. And you know what? Some people just need some encouragement. They need a friend. They need somebody to say it's good to see you. They need that. And if I'm, if I'm not careful, I will become partial to certain people, but I will neglect other people. And that's what really partiality encompasses. More than just... Showing favoritism to one, but neglecting the other. And I showed us this. Number one, that partiality, it, it is contrary to the personality of God. It's contrary to the nature of who God is. That's why he says in verse 1, he said, My brethren, my, uh, my, my, my brethren in Christ, I'm not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons. Why? Because God is not a respecter of persons. And he's saying, you and I should not be a people of partiality, because God is not. And I gave some examples, Romans 2.11, for there is no respect of persons with God. Clinton, don't worry about putting it up there, because we're just going to move quickly straight on through. But I can give you many reasons why God is not partial according to Scripture. And so therefore, he deals with number two, the people of God. That, 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 that it is something that shouldn't be named among the people of God. Why in verse 1 does he say, my brethren? Because he's trying to get their attention. That, that God is not a respecter of persons. And if God is my Father, if I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, believing He suffered, bled, and died for me, arose victoriously after three days, if He is my Heavenly Father, do you think His son or daughter should act that way? No. It's okay to say amen. <laughs> So the people of God, I believe, are mentioned. It's inconsistent with, with the people of God. It should be. But number three, we're moving quickly. Like I said, we're trying to get to the last point. And uh, number three, I want you to notice that the value that it places, the value it places on other people. Because he says in verse number two, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and a goodly, and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. That vile raiment just means humble clothing. And, and he gives a great contrast between two people. When he says they're coming to your assembly, a man with gold, it's the idea he's dripping with gold. I mean, he's got gold. He, he reminds me of Mr. T. You know, remember him? He had the gold chains. He had the gold rings. I mean, he's so cool. I mean, if I'm on the A-team, I want to be Mr. T. I want to be like him. And, uh, but you know something, that's the idea. And he's saying that you see somebody and you externally can tell that they are, I mean, they are loaded with money. But then you see somebody else and they just have humble clothing. That's the idea of vile raiment. You have two contrasts, two classes of people. And if we're not careful, we can look at somebody based on the external, what we see. And we want to give them attention. But what about the other person? Does that value them the same way? You know what, their, their bank account may not be the same. But remember what I told you, the gospel is the great what? Leveler. <laughs> we all stand level at the foot of the cross. You know what, in this lifetime some people can stand upon their wallet and be taller than me. But let me tell you something, when I came to Jesus Christ by faith and I was at the foot of the cross, it didn't matter the money I had, it didn't matter the clothing on my body, it didn't matter anything about me. It was the matter that Jesus suffered, bled, and died for me as He did for you. And when I show partiality to certain people or I neglect other people, I don't show value to their soul. And I want to ask you a question. How much are people worth? Can you put a price tag on that? You know, God didn't put a price tag on it. You say, how is that? 
Because he didn't buy us, or he didn't redeem us. He didn't pay the ransom for us with gold or silver or all the planets in our solar system. What did he give? His only begotten son, the Lord Jesus. So you know what that tells me about people? They are of the greatest value. Not just an important value, not just a high value. They are of the most important value one can ever find. You can't put a price tag on the Son of God dying for mankind and being raised victoriously. You cannot put a price tag on it. And he talks about as he goes down, and I, I worked my way through that, so I don't want to too much deal with it, but it's interesting. I just want to show you real quickly. I, I kind of alluded to it last week, but verse 5, he says, Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? You know what? You can be poor with a, with a bank account that is in the negative. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's depressing to look at. You hit it again, and it's depressing. But you know something? Here's the reality of it. You can be poor in this world, but I can tell you what, you can meet some people that are rich in faith. You know what's interesting about the life of Christ? He said he didn't even have a place to lay his head. <laughs> he didn't have really the monetary... You, you would think that he would have something... But he really didn't have anything. You know, his disciples, when they walked with him, they really didn't either. And I'm, not a, I'm not saying we should live in that regard. I believe God blesses different ways. But you know, the reality is, God's chosen some crazy things in my mind. If I can put it that way. I don't know about you, but let me just give you some quick examples, okay? One, I would not pick a donkey to talk to somebody. Okay, I'd have a heart attack if, if I'm Balaam and my donkey talks to me and I'm thinking, whoo! You know what I'm saying? It tells me if God can choose a donkey to be a preacher, surely He can help me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, seriously. But you know what? Even the Bible talks about that God doesn't choose the, not many mighty, not, not many noble, not, not many of those people, not many people of nobility, but He's chosen the base things, the foolish things the world says. The people that are uneducated, the people that doesn't seem that they can be used of God, even the people in Jesus' day, Peter, James, and John, they were fishermen from this lowly town in Galilee. And you know what's interesting about it? They knew that, but they took notice that they had been with Jesus. You know the beautiful thing about it is when God uses people that seem foolish, who gets the glory? God does. <laughs> And you can put a note down in your notes later. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27 allude to who God chooses. But now I want to deal with the precepts of God, okay? As I said, I, I could take more time, but I did that last week, and I really want to finish this up um, because I only have two points, okay? But I want to deal with the precepts of God. That's a fancy word for the law of God, for the word of God, okay? The word precept just deals with God's law or His word, okay? And you say, why did you do that? Because it just helps my mind. It flows with my mind, okay? But I want to draw your attention to verse 8. Again, he's dealing with partiality. Verse 8, he says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy, love thy neighbor as thyself. He said, you do well. Now let's just stop right there for a minute. He says, or verse 9, But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. Why does he call the, the law of God the royal law? The royal law. Who decreed the Ten Commandments? God did. He's the supreme authority. He is the sovereign one. And so therefore it's called the royal law. The royal law. It's His law. It's not my law that I love my neighbor as myself. It's the law of God, the royal law. And what he's saying is this. He brings into play the Ten Commandments. Why? I said last week that you have Ten Commandments that encompass every one of God's commandments. You have Ten Commandments. The first four deal with my relationship with God. The second part, or the six remaining commandments, deal with my relationship with mankind. And you know what? If I love the Lord thy God with all my heart, all my mind, all my strength, will I have any other gods before Him? No. Will I make any graven images? Will I blaspheme His name? Will I set aside a day devoted unto Him and resting in Him? Absolutely. It deals with my relationship with God, the first half. But the second half, 
The second half, deal with my relationship with man. And you know what? If I don't love my brethren like, or people around me like I should, I don't value them, I'll steal from them, I'll kill them, I'll, I'll covet what they have, I'll do all of that. You see the difference? And he brings it into play because of this reason. If I respect people based on externals, you know what I'm doing? I'm breaking the law of God in more than one ways. Because he says, Jesus said this, all the law and the prophets can be hung on these two right here. Love the Lord with everything. Summed up. And love thy neighbor. He said, the second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And let me say this. How many of you, and I want you to be serious, you, you can raise your hand, even if you want to raise it this way. All right? Even if you want to go back and raise it. How many of you love yourself? All right, my hand is up. Two hands is up. I don't miss a meal, okay? I make sure my hair is all right. And you know what? The more I get older, the less it gets right here. Amen. I heard somebody say one of the, the manliest things a man can do is lose his hair. It's just part of being a man. I, I guess I'm not to manhood yet. But you know something? Now check this out. When I'm partial to people, he says if you fulfill the royal law, you do well. Love thy neighbor as thyself. When I have partiality, the so-and-so, am I loving my other people around me like I should? Yes or no? No. No, I don't value them. So if, I, if, I, if I'm a person that fulfills the royal law, it says this, that I love, thy I love my neighbor as myself. I, I don't neglect them. I don't neglect this body. I'm telling you, I buffet this body with the food <laughs> from heaven, just about. I don't neglect my own self. I make sure I'm taken care of. And it's the idea that, that you know what, when I realize partiality is in direct violation with the law of God and loving thy neighbor as thyself. And it's interesting that you can put down later in your notes, go look at Matthew 22, 37 through 40. That's when Jesus talks about on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And He deals with loving God and loving your neighbor. And who is your neighbor? Everybody. <laughs> and what's interesting about it, as we get back into this section, He says, verse number 9, He says, but if you have respect to persons, you commit what? Sin. You know what He's saying? If you show partiality to somebody, it's not just shameful, it's sinful. And he equates it in this regard. He takes it to two extremes, okay? Look what he does. He says, if you, commit, uh, if you have respect to persons, verse 9, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Transgressors are the idea of transgressing the law of God. You overstep the bounds of God. I mean, his heart's just jumped a little bit. It's <laughs> a little tactic to keep your blood pumping. Keeps you awake. But you know what he uses that word, transgressor. And then he says, verse number 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of how much? How much is he guilty of? He's guilty of all of it. You know what? In the eyes of God, you're perfect or you're not. You're guilty or you're innocent. It is no in-between. There's nothing that we can't do to either... We, we look at it this way, black or white. You're, you're guilty, you're innocent. You've either been perfect or you're not. And let me say it this way. Not one person born upon this world will ever stand before God and be perfect. You know how I know that? Because if I could be perfect for one moment, then why did Jesus Christ suffer for me, bleed for me, die for me, and be raised from the dead for me? That's what we need to understand. And he says this. He says, if you are guilty of one point of the law, he brings the precepts into it. He's trying to show the people in that day, it's not just shameful, it's sinful. When I show partiality and I neglect people, I show favoritism to one and I neglect another person, it's sinful. And he equates it in this regard. Let's keep going, okay? What's well, convicting? Is it not reading James? I mean, you, you, it'll walk all over, you know what I mean? 
He that said, do not commit adultery, also said this. And by the way, this is the royal law. All right? And by the way, this is man's relationship with who? Mankind. All right? And by the way, if you love man like you should, would you kill him? No, you will not. If you love uh, mankind like you should, you wouldn't kill him. You wouldn't bear false witness against him. He said, now if thou kill, or if thou... Uh, uh, Verse 11, for he said, do not commit adultery. It said, also do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, uh, where's it at? Thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now, I believe this. He's not saying that all sin, now listen to me, all sin is wrong, right? It's guilty. It, it's something that God does not like. He disdains, okay? Sin is something Jesus paid for. But if you think that all sin carries the same weight, it does all carry death. But let me say this, in the nation of Israel, it had different consequences. If you don't believe so, capital punishment was carried out for death of killing somebody else. So it's not really trying to say that all sin is just sin, though he is. What he's saying is, is if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty, period. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're guilty of lying, you're guilty. If you're guilty of stealing, you're guilty. If you're guilty of killing, you're guilty. If you're guilty of murder, you're guilty. And if you're guilty of respect of persons, what is it? Sin. It's guilt before God is what he's saying. And he's saying that if you are a respecter of persons, you are guilty before God. You've broken the royal law of not loving your neighbor as yourself. And what I'm trying to drive home is this right here. When we come in contact with people, forget all that they have to bring to the, to, to the plate. And I'm not saying the offering plate. I'm saying to God's plate of life and bringing about what they can contribute. See them for a person of value before God. And don't neglect people, okay? And this idea of, 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 of guilt before God, he's just showing the guiltiness. Let, let, let me give you an example this way. D.L. Moody put it this way. A tenfold chain is the law of God. Okay, imagine you've got ten chain links. You're hanging over a precipice. You're about to fall to your death, and you're holding on to that chain. Okay? We're, we're get, we got the image in our mind, right? We're hanging over a precipice, about to fall into a volcano, be cooked alive. Shish kebabbed. We're going to fry like a Jimmy Dean sausage. You know what I'm saying? You say, what is that? That's, that's sausage down south. We got Jimmy Dean up here, don't we? Okay, yeah. We don't have Nisa sausage is what I'm thinking. Best thing, I'm telling you. Good. But, um, but you're hanging over a precipice, okay? Now we think that, you know what? We've got to break this law, this law, this law, this law, and then we're guilty, okay? Well, let me put it this way. If you have nine links break, and you're holding on to the very last one, you're just holding on to one little link, all right? But you have nine of them break. What's going to happen? You're going to fall to your death. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's take it less. What if you have five links break, and you're holding on to the last link? Over this precipice, what's going to happen? You're going to fall to your death. Let's take it even less. What if one link, and only one link breaks, and you're holding on to that one little link? and you're hanging over a precipice, what's going to happen? You're going to fall to your death. You know, the reality is, if you break one law of God, you're guilty. And that's what he's saying. He's encompassing the fact that partiality, it shows this right here. It's guilty in the eyes of God. It's something that should be viewed not shamefully, but sinfully. It's contrary to the precepts of God. Number five and finally, and that's this. I want you to notice the punishment that follows as we stand before God. It's inexcusable, by the way. All right, the penalty that follows, I should say. Notice what he says, verse 12. He says, So speak ye, and so do they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth, he says, against judgment. Now, what is he talking about? He's dealing with the fact that it's inexcusable. Partiality is inexcusable when we stand before God. Verse number 12. 
And he talks about the law of liberty. He wants us to be liberated, to live a free life, to know what it is to live in the perfect law of liberty daily. And the joy of what it is. You know what liberty, it, it speaks, liberty speaks of freedom not to do what we want, but to do as we all. That's what liberty truly is as a Christian. It's not freedom to do this or that or this or that. It's liberty is understanding I've got freedom now to choose to do as I all. You know what? As God saved my soul, the liberty that I have, I can express that and share that with anybody. Amen. I can show them that same love, that same compassion, that right there. That's what he's talking about. That's, that's liberty. You want to talk about liberty? That's liberty. He talks about to do right. But notice verse number 13. He says, for he shall have judgment without mercy. Talking about the, the ones that are partial. The ones that show partiality. He says he shall have judgment without mercy. That hath showed no mercy. And you know what he's dealing with right here? When we show mercy, guess what God does? He gives more mercy. You know, as I was reading and studying and just thinking, God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace, but God is a God of mercy. And when I show mercy, guess what? God gives mercy. And He gives more mercy. But let me say this. When we withhold mercy as the people of God, God has the right to chastise us and get us right. Let me take it this way and put it this way, okay? He takes us out to the spiritual woodshed and beats the devil out of us in a simple, polite, and loving manner. We, we understand what I'm saying? You know the spiritual woodshed? It's where mom and daddy used to take you. They wear you out and tell you, now you act... You act crazy. You go ahead and run wild. But when we get home, boy, I'm going to get a hold of you and I'm going to wear you out. It was for me, my grandpa. Grandpa, don't, please don't hit me. <laughs> Not in a bad way. He disciplined me. I tell you what, he had bear claws too. It's the idea of chastising his people is what it is. And what God is teaching right here. It's going to be inexcusable the day I stand before God. And when I show partiality to people, or I neglect people, God's saying this, you mark it down, you can get it right, or I'm going to get it right. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would rather correct my ways than have God correct my ways for me. When He says, that's sin, should we take sin and get it out of our lives? Absolutely. You know, the problem is many times, we don't see it as sin. We don't see it as sinful when I look at somebody and I believe the Holy Spirit is leading me in my heart just to encourage so-and-so. Just to say, it's good to see you here today. You know what? When I go on my merry way neglecting them, is that not being a person that's neglecting them? Wouldn't that be a little partial if I'm going to do something else, favoring somebody else? It is. And it's sinful. I heard an interesting story. And I'll close with this. A man lived in uh, a certain part of this world, and I'm not going to tell you who, not yet, because it'll, uh, it'll, it'll give the story away, maybe, to some people. But he was from a different part of this world, and specifically the time in which he grew up and the land in which he grew up, they had caste societies. And so the idea was they had certain classes of people. They had many different classes of people. And by the way, they could not marry up from their class of people. They had to pretty much stay in the caste that they were in. And, and they were certain people in that society were looked down upon for being the lowest of the lower, the poorest of the poor. And so one of the men in that day, he was in college. And as he was in college, he began reading. He began studying and, and wanting to, to learn more about Christianity because he heard about this figure named Jesus. And he, he thought, man, Jesus is a fascinating character. So he, met, he read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Wouldn't you say that's a good place to start to find out about Jesus? Amen. And he, he was moved by what he read and heard about Jesus. And so what he did is he was in college, a young college student. He found a church. And he had his heart geared towards this, this church, wanting to ask questions, wanting to find out some truth, wanting to know about salvation, wanting to know more about Jesus, and, and he's excited. He's just blown away. He said to himself, this is the answer to my country right here. 
If they can get a hold of this truth, it will make all the difference in the world. That young man went to that church. He went to the front door. He had some ushers meet him. Thank God we got some good ones. They don't shake you down. Hey, they don't give you a hard time. But you know what? That, that young man went to the door. Those ushers met him. They looked at him, and I kid you not, you can read in this man's autobiography. They looked at him, and they turned him away, and they said this. Go meet with your own people. And you know what? As he was met at that door, and his own family, I'm talking about his own kinsmen according to the flesh, as Paul said, they looked down on him because of his social status. He fit, he fit this right here perfectly to a T. He had humble raiment. He wasn't nothing spectacular. He was a young man searching for truth. And they told him just to go meet, find another church that fits your, your class of people. That man was a man by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. How many people have ever heard of Mahatma Gandhi? He was a leader in the nation of in the, the Israel, the nation of India. And Mahatma Gandhi said this, if it weren't for Christians, or if, if Christians acted more like Christ, I'd become a Christian. And he said, if it weren't for Christians, I'd be a Christian. <laughs> he was fascinated and blown away by how Jesus Christ walked among men, loved men, women, boys, and girls. He was turned away by these people that were quote-unquote Christians that showed partiality to one and neglected him. You know what I wonder just for a moment? I wonder how many people we've come in contact with, and maybe we don't turn them away per se, maybe we don't even turn them off, but how many times do we not go out of our way and say, it is good to see you today, and mean it. Or go to them and encourage them, get to know them. If I ask you to answer this, don't answer it out loud. How many people have been in this church that you have not got to know or neglected and not talked to? Is that not convicting to think about? You know what we should view it as? Not just shameful, but sinful. You know, I wonder one day if that man truly was a Christian. Now, I'm, not, I'm not doubting his salvation because Christians can act like some of the sorriest people you can meet. You want me to be honest with you? But I wonder, as he stands before God, as Mahatma Gandhi died a, a Hindu, I just wonder, that those, those, those ushers, I wonder how they feel, or will feel one day, knowing that they pushed this man away by being partial. Should that be named among the, God, the people of God? Should we be a people of partiality? No. Should we love people? That's why he shows the flaw or fatalism of favoritism. It's not a good thing to be favorable, nor partial. Have no respect of persons for people. God doesn't. I'm not saying that we should excuse sin. It's not saying that at all. Sin is sin, and sin is wrong. Well, you know what? I can see value in a person when I get to come in contact with them. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to ask Mrs. Page to come. I want to ask you a question with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. How many of you, nobody is looking around, I promise you. How many of you have been guilty of being partial? Either by neglecting somebody or favoring somebody else. That encompasses the whole realm of partiality. Like, you know what, as I said, in my Christian life, it's shameful to say, I've been that way, but even more than shameful, it's sinful. And it needs to be confessed and forsook. And you know something? I pray that God gives us a spirit that's not of partiality, but, but, but of seeing people for who they are, people of value, no matter what they may have or what they may not have. So I want to take this moment as Mrs. Page, you softly play something. Let's take this quiet moment right now and just ask the Lord to help us not to be a people of partiality.
Our Father, as we come before you, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. And God, we thank you for your grace. Now, Lord, as we leave here, we ask you to be with us and help us. And uh, Father, may your word still richly and supremely and preeminently rule in our hearts and our minds and help us as we leave here to be conformed unto the image of your Son, to be more like Jesus every day, Father. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just before we're dismissed, I'm going to let Ray...